I want to say we, we can hear the sound of littles in the service, and that is an absolute blessing. Um, and your little ones are absolutely welcome to stay here in the service with you if you want. I love that sound of little ones in the service. That's the evidence of God's blessing in your life. But I also notice this look on mom's faces when, they, when their littles make noise. And they kind of look around like, oh my goodness. So mom, if you're more comfortable, we do have a big cry room downstairs. There's a room for them. There's a room for you. I'm not saying you have to take them down there. There's room for them. There's room for you down there. So if you are more comfortable with that, just know that we do have that available downstairs. You can follow along in the service in the cry room as well. Kids are more than welcome to stay here. But I want to make that aware, uh, make you aware of that. I noticed several moms as I've taken them down there and showed them the cry room. They said, oh, I didn't know this was here. So it is downstairs if you want to take, a, take advantage of it. Well, take out your Bibles this morning, turn to Romans chapter 8, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans there in the New Testament. If you still have your bulletin where we were last week in 1 Corinthians, just turn, start turning back towards the front cover. The next book back is the book of Romans. We're going to Romans chapter 8 this morning, and we're continuing in our study of the titles that the scripture gives to the church. How does the Bible identify us as the church? And so we're continuing in that a study this morning, we're looking at the title this morning, The Family of God, there in Romans chapter 8. As believers, we have the incredible privilege of being able to say that we are a part of God's family. Now, notice I said that only believers have that privilege. Only believers have, only those who have repented of sins and trusted in Christ, we are the only ones that have the privilege of being able to say that we are part of God's family. I wish I could say, there are some that will say, and I wish I could agree with them and say that every single person who has ever lived and every person who ever will live is a part of God's family, has God as their father. I wish I could say that, but I can't. Uh, and the reason I can't is because the Bible doesn't teach that, that every single person who has ever lived is a part of God's family. Now, every single person who has ever lived is one of God's creatures, absolutely. Created by God, and the scripture says that before I knit you in the womb, I knew you. Every single person who has ever lived and everyone who ever will live is one of God's creatures, yes, but not every one of them can claim they are part of God's family. Jesus said this in John chapter 8, verse 42. Now he's speaking there to the Pharisees, the religious of the religious of their day. And if anyone got all the boxes checked and did everything right, it would have been the Pharisees. And this is what he said to them in John chapter 8, verse 42. He said to them, if God were your father you would love me. An indication there that though they got all the religious boxes checked and they did everything right from the religious standpoint, God was not their father. They, they were not in that relationship with him. As a matter of fact, he goes on in verse 44 there of John chapter 8, and he said, your father is the devil. Your father is the enemy. Not everyone who will, has walked this earth and not everyone who will walk this earth has that privilege of being able to say, I am a part of the family of God. In fact, the Bible says the only ones who can claim that are those who received him, who believe in his name. Those are the ones that he gave the right to be called children of God. So I want us to notice something this morning. That's an incredible privilege then with that title, an incredible blessing with that title to be a part of the family of God. And I want us to notice what those are. Now here in Romans chapter 8, that in Christ... If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that we are full-fledged members of the family of God, and that brings with it some incredible blessings that you and I can enjoy right now in this life. Follow along with me there in Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> starting in verse 14. I'm just going to read four verses starting there in verse 14 of Romans chapter 8. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery, leading again to fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. And Father, would you bless our time together this morning? Lord, as we have opened your word, and we think about the incredible privilege, the incredible blessing of being a part of your family. Father, we pray you'd speak to our hearts today. Help us to, to realize them. Help us to understand them, Lord. If there's one here this morning that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, they can't say they're a part of your family, Lord. I pray you'd speak especially to their heart this morning. 
Father, would you bless us in these next few moments, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you've got your Bibles open there to Romans chapter 8, and I want to show you three blessings that we can experience, that we can have right now, that we can know for real in our lives as members of the family of God. And my purpose, my intent this morning is to challenge us a little bit, is to challenge us, challenge our thinking so that, so that we realize these blessings and not only challenge the way we think about it, but to encourage us to, to live like these blessings are real in our lives. So you follow along. The first blessing that I think we see there in Romans chapter 8 for us as the family of God is simply the identification as God's family. He calls us sons and daughters. That is an amazing thing. The identification as the family of God. And, and he points it out right, just right there in verse 14. He said, those who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now, I want to say, first of all, he is not indicating that if you just look through Scripture and find the things that God wants his children to do, here's commandments, and you can find them, write them all down. If you find them, and then you begin to live by those commandments, begin to follow all of the things that, that the Scripture teaches us. I mean, he is not suggesting that if you start living that way, then that makes you a son of God. That's a very works-based idea that said, I can earn that title, the Son of God, just by doing what the Spirit says? Well, sign me up for that. That's not at all what he's saying. Because the reality is, is that you and I will never do that. And if our being in God's family, if our having that level of a relationship with Him is dependent on my faithfulness, dependent on me being able to keep all of the, the things that Scripture commands, well, I can just write it off. I can forget it. It's simply not going to happen. He is not suggesting that that's who are called the sons of God. Rather, this is what he is saying. You want to know who they are? Those are the ones that follow God. It's the result of our relationship, a result of us being sons and daughters of God. That's the result is that we are being led by the Spirit. It's as though he sees the, the Spirit walking down the street and the sons of God are the ones that are in line behind and following. You want to see who they are? There they are. They're following their father. That's who the sons of God are. In other words, the leadership of the Holy Spirit is one of the blessings of our identification in the family of God. But the Spirit of God is not just present in our lives, not just convicting us of sins, and that's not always comfortable for us, but it is a blessing of God. But He is leading our lives, and His leadership is one of the blessings that we have as a son or daughter of God. And one of those blessings, one of the aspects of those blessings of His leadership in our lives is that we recognize His voice. We can hear the voice of God. We can recognize it. Now listen, there will be a lot of voices that will speak to you in your life. And I will say this, if you're hearing voices up here, only up here, then maybe you need to get that checked out. But there will be a lot of voices you'll hear. But not every one of them is from God. A lot of voices calling you to do this or calling you to be that or calling you to live that way or calling you to think this way. There will be a lot of voices that we will hear calling out to us, but not every one of them is the voice of God. How many of you have had this experience? You've been in a foreign city and you're standing there and it's one of the most beautiful places in a, in a foreign city and there's a crowd around there. Several years ago, Jean and I went to Prague, and we stood there in that main square in Prague, and there's that enormous, beautiful clock there, and we're checking it out, and there's a bunch of locals standing around. And they're speaking the local language, and we don't understand a word of it. And that, when they're speaking, all of that is just noise, right? It's just sound. None of that impacts me in any way. I don't have any idea what they're talking about, any idea what's going on. But then imagine you're standing in that crowd, and you hear this sound, and suddenly your husband or your wife, or one of your children, calls out to you. Now, it's not just the language that you recognize, it's that voice, right? Instantly, that cuts through the noise, and all of that stuff that previously was just undistinguished sound, there's one sound that cuts through it, and you instantly recognize that voice. See, that's one of the blessings of being a, a son or a daughter of God, is that we recognize God's voice. It cuts through the noise of this world. Listen to what Jesus said. John chapter 10, verse 27. He said, my sheep, he's talking about his followers. My sheep know my voice. 
as a son or daughter of God, one of the blessings, how he leads us is that we know. We, we, we often say, and we hear other people say that God led me to do this, and he does. And we can take that thing that we sense to be the, the voice of God and bring it back to his word and say, does this align with something God would tell me to do? We say, he is speaking to me. His voice cut through the clutter and it cut through the noise. I know that's the voice of God. That's one of the blessings of being a child of God is that we know his voice. Another blessing is that we have the blessing of following the leadership of his spirit. As he leads in our lives, as he steps out ahead of us and calls us and beckons us to follow him, we have the blessing to do that. But that requires some things, doesn't it? If we're going to follow the leadership of the Spirit, if the sons of God are going to be led by the Spirit of God, that requires a few things on our part. That requires, first of all, a willingness to let Him lead. Now, if you have, if you have a, a, a job, you're in the military, you have a boss, right? A supervisor. Maybe you have a flight chief. Maybe you have a commander. If you're not, if you don't work for the military, you have a boss of some kind. And there are things that your boss does that you don't get involved in. There are tasks that, that your boss has that, quite frankly, you're glad they have them because you don't want to mess with that stuff. And you're not getting paid to mess with that stuff anyway, so you're glad your boss does all that stuff. You don't get involved in telling them how to deal with those things, and they don't ask you how to deal with those things. You're glad to let your boss lead. But how many times in our lives... Do we say, I want to be led by the Spirit of God. Wherever you lead, I'll go, God. And then we start to meddle in what he's doing. Okay, but, but God, may, maybe we ought to just do it this way. Or, or maybe, maybe can you just tweak it a little bit because I'm not really comfortable or happy with what you've asked me to do right there. Yeah, I want you to lead, God, but, but, but how about this? How about we just do it this way? We say, I want the leadership of God in my life, and I won't meddle in my boss's affairs. I'm more than glad to let my boss lead, but I'm not so much glad. I want to meddle in how God leads my life. One of the things, one of the, the blessings is the ability to follow after the Spirit, but that requires that we allow Him to lead, that we're willing to let Him take the lead in our lives. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Paul said this. He said, be filled with the Spirit. Now, he compares it and contrasts that there. He says, do not be drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. He contrasts that there with being under the influence of alcohol. And it's a similar concept, he's saying, not that we lose all our faculties, but that we are under the control of the Spirit. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. You've seen somebody who's had a little too much to drink, and they are hardly in control of themselves hardly in control of their thought pattern, hardly in control of what they do. That thing, that other thing, has control over them. And he kind of makes that comparison. Don't, don't let that control your life, but be under the control of the Holy Spirit. Allow the Spirit to lead your life. That's what he's saying. It's one of the blessings of being a son or a daughter of God, is that he will lead our lives. We have to be willing to let him lead, though. Also implies, though, a willingness to follow. Not just a, a willingness to let him lead, but a willingness to follow him where he leads. There's a popular saying, it used to be on bumper stickers in the States, and I don't really know if anybody actually puts bumper stickers on their cars anymore. But for a while, this was a popular saying on bumper stickers on cars, and it said, God is my co-pilot. God is not our co-pilot. God is not your co-pilot. The co-pilot is not in charge of the plane. The pilot is in charge. The captain is in charge. The co-pilot has one job and one job only, and that is to support the pilot, right? The co-pilot is not the one who is in charge of that plane. God is not your co-pilot. God is the commander. God is the one who is in charge. We're blessed to be able to sit in the back of the plane. We not only have the blessing of the leadership of the Spirit, we have to be willing to let Him lead, but we have to be willing to follow Him. Jesus said not only do His sheep hear His voice, but listen to what else He said. He said, I know them. And then listen to this, and they follow me. Now, back in Jesus' day, they would have these big sheepfolds, they called them. Just a big pen or a big yard or a big shelter for the sheep. And in that sheep pen, 
They might have five, six, seven, eight different flocks of sheep. The shepherd would bring them all, put them all together, so they had a safe place to put them. And there might be several flocks of sheep in that specific sheepfold. But something amazing would happen. That shepherd would come and he would stand at the gate of that sheepfold and he would call out to his sheep. I don't know how you call sheep. They're not like dogs where you can call them by name. I don't know which here, sheepy, sheepy. I don't know how you call sheep. But he would stand there at the door of that pen. He would call his sheep. And out of all of those flocks, six, seven, eight flocks, here's something amazing would happen. His sheep and only his sheep would follow him. He would call them and turn and walk away from that. And every one of his sheep would follow him out of that pen. Only his sheep. Why? Because they knew his voice. And they trusted him. Inherent in allowing the, the, the Spirit to lead our lives and being willing to let Him lead and inherit and follow Him is, is, a, is a measure of trust. It says, I may not know, shepherd, where you're going, but I trust you. The path might be dark and I don't know where it leads when it goes into the woods, but I trust you. The, the sons and daughters of God being led by the Spirit of God means that we have not only a, we allow Him to lead, but then we're willing to follow Him. Wherever you lead, I will go. And to follow Him simply means to go where He goes, to do what He does when you get there. That's what it means to follow, right? That's not overly complicated. To follow Him means we go where He goes, and we, we do what He does when we get there. I talked to a guy several years ago, and we were talking about this very topic, about following the Lord and following his leadership in our lives and going where Jesus goes and doing what he does when we get there. And he said this to me. He said, you know, I feel like I need to watch all of the same movies and stuff that my unsaved friends watch so that I can relate to them. And I feel like that, that I need to maybe even hang out at the bar with them and get a little tipsy with them so, so I'm one of them that I can relate to them. We have something in common. And when we're in the workplace, I, 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 I will talk like they talk so that we have something in common. You know, Jesus had made it a habit of hanging out with the unsaved. In fact, the Pharisees threw this at him like it was an insult. He's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But there was something dramatic, dramatically different about what Jesus did when he got there with those tax collectors and sinners. He hung out with them. He brought the gospel to them. He said, listen, it's not the well that needs a, need a doctor. It is the sick. I've got to bring them the cure that they don't even know they need yet. But when he got there with those sinners, he hung out with them. He ministered to them, but he never did what they did. He never got involved in the sin that they got involved with. And the question for us, I'm going to go where he goes. Maybe I'm even going to purposely put myself in the path of the unsaved. I'm going to go where he goes, but when I get there, am I going to do what he does, or am I going to do what they do? To follow after Jesus really, just literally means we go where he goes, and we do what he does when we get there. And hearing his voice and a willingness to let him lead, a willingness to follow, those are marks of the identification of the sons of God. They're also the proof of us being the sons and the daughters of God. The second blessing of being a part of God's family is not just the identification of the family, but the implications of family. What does it mean to be family? What does it mean to be a part of a family? We talk about us as the family of God. What does it mean? What are the implications of being family? Someone once said this, family are those people that even if you show up uninvited, they have to take you in. That's what family is. Somebody else said it this way, children can really brighten up a family, mostly because they never turn the lights off. We think about the concept of family, the idea of what it means to be a part of a family. And that means different things to a lot of different people, but there in verse 15, he gives us an indication of what it means to be a part of God's family. Look again at verse 15. You have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you've received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Being a part of God's family means that you and I don't need to live in this sense of fear. We don't need to live in fear in this life. 
See, that's how sin rules. Sin rules with an iron fist, and it rules by fear. Fear of failure. You can't measure up. You can't do it well enough. Fear of rejection. That's how sin rules our lives. Fear of shame. Fear of guilt that eventually all of this is going to come out. And people are going to find out just what kind of person I really am. That's how sin rules our lives. With that iron fist and that iron fist of fear, that's what sin does in our lives. But he said, listen, you've been delivered from that. If you're part of the family of God, He has not given you a spirit of slavery that puts you back into fear. You've been set free from that. You don't have to live that way. Over in chapter 6, verse 17, he said this, But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, now you're not. That's not a reality in your life anymore. Those chains have been broken. And that fear that used to rule your life like that, that doesn't rule your life anymore. You've traded that in on a new model, and that new model is the spirit of adoption. That's what rules our lives now. i got to tell you, that's one of the most amazing truths in Scripture, that the, the God of the universe, the sovereign king over every single thing, has adopted you and I as children. That is one of the most amazing truths in all of Scripture. Dr. David Dykes the pastor of Green Acres Baptist Church in Tyler, Texas. I don't have any idea where Tyler, Texas is. It's in eastern Texas somewhere. And when I first met Dr. Dykes, he told me he was a pastor of the church in Tyler, Texas. And I assumed Tyler was a one-stop light town. Like a lot of towns in eastern Texas, that's what I assumed it looks like. Dr. Dykes' church, Green Acres Baptist Church, has 14,000 members at his church. So either every single person in Tyler, Texas goes to his church, or that town is a lot bigger than I think it is. But he tells this story of a time he was preaching at a youth camp, and he said a, a teenage girl came to him, and she said, Dr. Dykes, you know that I'm adopted. My parents, have, uh, my parents had my younger brother by the normal means, but you know, I've always felt so special in our family. Because when he was born, well, they had to take whatever they got. But with me, I realized they chose me to be their daughter. You know, that's an amazing truth. That in God's family, we have that spirit of adoption. That God has chosen us to be sons and daughters. That is an amazing reality for us. Now, this is the fourth of the biblical identities that we are looking at for the church. And I, and I want you to notice, I have foot stomped this with every single one of them, and I'm going to foot stomp it again today. And that is the common theme of all of these. The choosing act of God for that relationship in our lives. We talked about the bride of Christ, the church as the bride of Christ, and how the bride has been chosen for the bridegroom. We are chosen to be his bride. And then we talked about us as the people of God, that we are a chosen nation as the people of God. And last week we looked in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we talked about the church as the body of Christ. That when we are saved, God gives us a specific spiritual gift and chooses us to be a part of his body, both the universal church and the local church. Every one of those, there is a choosing of God. And then here, he's chosen us to be adopted as his sons or daughters. Now listen, there may come a time when you begin to doubt God's commitment to you. Doubt is one of those, those tools that Satan has used from the very beginning. It's the first one he started with. And he keeps using it. And you know why he keeps using it? Because we keep falling for it. And there will come a time when you will doubt God's commitment. Things may happen. Terrible things. Tragedy may strike. Things will get very difficult. There'll be a great burden on your shoulders. And you'll be tempted to doubt God's commitment. Does God, is, does God really love me? Is God still involved? Has he checked out and left the building? That time will come when you're tempted to question God's commitment to you. But let me remind you of this. No matter how you cut it, no matter how you look at this relationship that we have with God through Jesus Christ, no matter how you identify it, every single one of those brings us back to this point. God chose you for that relationship. Is God committed to you? Does God care about you? Are you important to God? 
is, are you valuable to him? He has chosen you for this relationship. And listen to what else he said in verse 16. He said, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, notice he didn't say that the Spirit of God testifies to our spirit, but with our spirit. That voice of the enemy is going to whisper in your ear, God doesn't really love you. God's forgotten about you. God's not really interested in what's going on in your life. I'm not even sure you can really trust him after all. And the enemy is going to whisper that in your ear. And we have two voices shouting back. The Spirit of God that lives within us that says, I know in whom I have believed. And I am trusting in Him. And then the Spirit of God testifies with our spirit. Yes, we are, we are children of God. We are loved of Him. We are important to Him. We are valuable to Him. There is no doubt. And that spirit of adoption, it not only gives us that security, but did you notice what else he said at the end of verse 15? That that spirit of adoption is sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, if you have children, and we notice many, many babies around the congregation, and be honest, there's a little competition in your home, right? For whether that child says mama first or daddy first. Now, you'll never say that, right? You'll never admit that in public, but there is a certain sense of pride to say, my child said daddy first, or my child said mama first. Well, in that culture, the, the, the word for daddy was Abba. You think about some of the first sounds a baby makes. Abba, 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 Abba. They, they, would, they, would, they would call out Papa. That's what it means. It's that intimate name for father, daddy, or Papa. And did you hear what he said? That as children of God, we have the right to cry out Abba to God the Father. Three of the four Gospels record that seen in the Garden of Gethsemane, the last days of Jesus' earthly life. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, so-called synoptic gospels. They give a synopsis of the same events. John's a very different gospel. It reads very different. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record that Garden of Gethsemane event. But only Mark records this. Mark chapter 14, verse, verse 36. He said, Jesus went off to pray by himself, and he fell down on his face, and he cried out, Abba, Father. If it is your will, let this cup pass before me. But not my will, but yours be done. And what an incredible reality to know that you and I can cry out to God the Father in the same way that Jesus the Son did. Abba, Father, Daddy, Papa. And notice he didn't say that we just call out, that we can just say it. We can cry out to him. There may be a time that you will be distressed. In the garden, Jesus was distressed, and maybe that's an understatement. Luke's gospel records of that event. Luke was a doctor. He would have picked up on this fact. Luke's gospel records that there in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was under such distress from the, the human perspective that he sweat droplets of blood. Now that's distressed. I got to be honest, I've never been that distressed. But there will come a point in time when there will be stressors in your life. And just like Jesus, in those moments when we feel like we can't take it, it's overwhelming, it's too much, we can cry out, Abba, Abba. But there will come a time, maybe, when you feel like nobody cares. Nobody even notices what's going on in my life. I wonder if anybody even cares what happens to me. And in those moments, we can get on our face before our Father in heaven and cry out, Daddy, I'm lonely. Will you come and just sit with me? Maybe you're, you'll experience pain, physical or emotional pain, and we can cry out, Papa, will you just come here and make it all better? Will you just come here and be with me? Whatever we go through, the discouragement, we, there may, maybe a day will come when you feel like, I can't get up tomorrow. I can't put one foot in front of the other. It's just too much. In those moments, we can cry out, Papa. To our Father in heaven, Daddy, will you just come and hold my hand in this moment? And what happens when we cry out, Abba? Well, let me ask you this. What happens when your children cry out to you? Maybe you're sitting there in the living room one evening, you're watching TV, and you hear from down the hall, you're, Daddy, come right now. 
Now, that's not that voice that says, Daddy, I want to drink a water in the middle of the night. That's not that voice. It's a much more urgent, it's a cry out, Daddy, come. Now, what do you and I do in that moment? Do you say, well, hang on a second, honey, I'll let's wait till a commercial and then I'll come. And then when the commercial comes, I'll sit down the remote and I'll saunter down the hallway. Is that how you respond? That's not how you and I respond to that cry. No, when that cry comes, Daddy, I need you right now. We get up and the remote falls and the bowl of popcorn spills and we're down the hallway in an instant. And listen to what Jesus said, Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. He said, if you as sinful parents know how to give good things to your children, listen to this, how much more your heavenly Father. Listen, when those times come, distress, discouragement, pain, overwhelming, I can't go on, and we cry out, Abba, Father, we can know He's going to be there. It's like you're going to be there for your children. He's going to be there right there with us, walking through it, holding our hand, just, just being in His presence, just having Dad nearby. It's a blessing of being called a, a son or a daughter of God, the implications of family. We don't have a lifeless, cold set of rules that we follow after, that we interact with. As believers, we have a Father in heaven who loves us more than we can ever even imagine. We have the identification as family of God. We have the implications of the family of God. And I want us to notice one more thing, very quickly. The inheritance of the family. The inheritance that you and I enjoy as sons and daughters in the family of God. Verse 17. If we are children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him so that we may also be glorified with Him. Have you ever read something in the Bible and and you you weren't sure you quite got it? You know, you you weren't quite certain that you understood really all that meant, but you believe it because it's in God's Word and He inspired it and I believe everything in the Bible. So I, I believe that I'm just not entirely sure I understand it all. Have you ever read something like that? Verse 17 was like that for me for a long time. I understand it, God. I understand you say we're heirs of God. We're co-heirs with Christ. But there's an aspect of that I just couldn't wrap my brain around. What does that mean? I'm not sure I fully get it. I believe it. I'm not sure I fully get it. As I was studying for the message this week, I had to step back from that passage and say, what does it mean? to be an heir? If if I'm named as someone's heir in their will, what does it mean that I am an heir? It means that that you have the rights and privileges of all the assets of that estate, right? All of those one day will belong to you. You have the rights and the privileges and access to all of the assets of that estate. That's what it means to be an heir. And then I had to say, well, what does it mean to be a co-heir? As a co-heir, if there's two, three, five, twenty, whatever, everyone has equal access to the, to the assets of that estate, right? That's what it means to be a co-heir. And then I had to come back and say, what does it mean that we're heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ? It means that all of the riches of the kingdom of heaven, all of the assets of the kingdom of heaven, you and I have equal access to. We have the, the ability to tap into those to utilize those resources. We have equal access to all of those resources that are within the kingdom of heaven. Dr. Warren Wiersbe said it this way. I really like this. He said, There is no need for the believer to be defeated in this life because the child of God can draw on all of God's resources. Why? Because he's an heir and he's a co-heir with Christ. And more than that, he said, the Spirit of God teaches us from the treasure chest of God's Word. And you know what? We're recipients of that wealth as His heirs. You and I have an incredible inheritance as members of the family of God, not just in this life, but on into eternity in the life to come. We have an incredible identification as the family of God, incredible implications that brings with it an incredible inheritance. And Paul wrote this to remind the church in Rome that they were no longer slaves. They were now sons. They had been set free. Their relationship changed. And all of the incredible blessings that came with that new relationship. God calls us His own. That's an amazing thing. 
He gives us all of the rights and privileges of being sons and daughters, including the ability to cry out daddy to him. And all the wealth of all the resources in heaven are ours for the using. Now I want to wrap up our time like this this morning. I want to ask you a question. Maybe you're here this morning, as, and as I talked about the fact that really only those who have repented of their sins and trusted in Christ, those have the right to be called children of God. Those have this relationship. And maybe you're here this morning, and you said, I'm not sure that's me. I'm not sure I have ever repented of my sins and trusted in Christ. If you ask me and pin me down, I have to say I'm not certain I'm a member of the family of God. This question applies to you. Or maybe you're here this morning, you know you're a member of the family of God, but you're not sure that all of these blessings are a reality. You're experiencing all of them in your life. And I want to wrap up with the same question for both groups this morning. What is keeping you from enjoying the blessings of being a part of God's family? And then maybe the second half of that question, and what are you going to do about it? Would you pray with me this morning? Father, you are such a wonderful God. When we least deserved anything from you, we least deserved your love, we least deserved your attention, we least deserved to even be noticed. You sent your son to die for us. Father, your love is beyond our ability to comprehend. You don't just save us from the, the punishment of hell. That would be enough. But you give us the rights and the privileges of being called sons and daughters of God. What an amazing thing. And Father, as we come into these moments of invitation, I realize there may be one or two here this morning that don't know for certain they're members of the family of God. Those are great privileges, they might think, and that'd be wonderful to have those blessings in my life, but I'm not a member of the family of God. Lord, would you continue to speak to their hearts in these moments? As you've made that clear to them, give them the courage, the boldness to just come down front and just settle it once and for all. Father, your children here this morning, many times we don't experience these blessings. We don't live like they're real. And Father, I pray you continue to speak to our hearts this morning to respond to your spirit in these next few moments, we pray in Jesus' name.